Uh, my name is Ricky, and I serve as one of the pastors here. Um, so imagine that, that you've planned this trip to go to Alaska. It's something that you've been excited about for, for years, and you've never been to Alaska, and, and you've planned the, this great trip up to the, the frontier, and you're going to get on a cruise ship in Alaska, and you're going to go on an Alaskan cruise. And um, this is a trip that you've planned. It would be amazing. You're excited for, for whale watching, for the buffets, for, for the relaxation, having other people clean up your things, wash your sheets, great service. And this is just a great time for you to get away and enjoy yourself. And so you've, you've planned this trip. You, you, get on, you drive to Omaha, you get on a plane, and you fly up to, to Alaska and you get up there and you just get off the plane and you're just smelling in the pine and, and just the, the fresh air. You look in the distance and you see snow-capped mountains and man, you're excited. This is, this is amazing. This is, you haven't been here ever before. You're, you're super excited to see things that, that you might not ever see again in the rest of your life. And so you make your way to the docks and you accidentally, unknowingly, don't get on the cruise ship that you're expecting to, to set sail on, but you make your way onto an expedition ship that's heading towards the Arctic. Now think about this. I mean, in this moment, you're like very confused. Everything is not the way that you expected it. Everybody is, you know, you expected to some, maybe greet, be greeted with a drink, and instead you're being told to grab some gear. You're, you're kind of making your way to this room and you expected to see nicely fresh pressed linens and, and clean sheets. But instead of that, well, there's a lot of other people now in, in this cold room and, and your bed is very narrow. And man, this is just not anything that you thought it would be. There's no buffet. There, there's no drinks. And people are asking you now to do some work, to grab things. This would be very confusing for you. It's not what you planned for. It's, not what you, it's definitely not what you paid for. You expected comfort, right? And this was supposed to be about you and your, your experience. And this ship is definitely not really what you had signed up for. Now, I mean, now we think about that in terms of a trip. But I just want to ask you is, is do we have a similar mentality? And would we be, are we just as shocked and confused when actually it comes to our Christian life. That when we think about our Christian life, we've kind of approached it with this, I'm ready for the cruise. I'm ready for my comfort. I'm ready for things to be kind of the way that I want them to be. And then we find along the way that, wow, I don't know if this is what I signed up for. And so we're going to be looking at today is, is did, what kind of ship did God really design us to be on? Did God design us for the cruise ship? Or is it something a little bit more like the expedition ship? And what does that, that really look like for us? And we're going to be looking at how God not, not wants to just change our expectations, but really our, our hearts and our perspectives. And so if you've got a Bible, open up to Luke 14. Luke is in the New Testament. Luke, so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, it's one of the Gospels. And so um, if you don't have a Bible, there's some there in the back. And if you need to, you could just take one and keep it. Uh, we've been going through this series called uh, At the Table. And we are encouraging people. And it's, it basically, it's just this series about, about meals, eating together. And we've been looking at, at the Scripture. And so the, the Bible, very, very early on, starts with a meal gone wrong. Adam and Eve... They eat the fruit that they've been told by God not to eat, and so they sin. They disobey God, and so that's very early on in the Bible. And if you look at the Bible towards the end, which we're going to be looking into this more next week, it, it ends with a, with a meal redeemed, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we've looked at, at Passover. The, the, you know, in the Old Testament, God gave them this meal to celebrate as his people. You really want to know who you are and celebrate who I've brought you to be and how I freed you? Here's a meal. Passover. And in the New Testament, again, it's communion. And we've looked at that. And we've looked at how eating together <clears throat> as people helps, helps us build community, how it helps us with discipleship. 
And, um, and today we're just going to keep looking into that. And so um, this, is, this is a six-week series, but it's part of a 40-week initiative that we want to have 1,000 shared meals in 40 weeks. And this is not to, for us to just hit some number, yay, we did 1,000 meals, but it's, it's to help shape us as a people, as a church, to know that, that we're wanting to build relationships with one another. We're wanting to build relationships, relationships with other people that we don't know as a community of God, but also with, with not just people in the church, but people out of the church that are not connected anywhere. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And so uh, Luke 14, verse 1, it says, one Sabbath... When he, talking about Jesus, when it went in to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they're watching him closely. And so this is the, one of the leading Pharisees. This is like varsity Pharisee. He's one of the top dogs. And, and, and it says that the, the, all of these Pharisees, the, re, the religious elite, the religious leaders, they're, they're watching Jesus closely. They're out to get him. They're out to, to see how he, you know, to trap him, whatever. And then so that's what they're doing. And then verse 2, there in front of him was a man who was swollen with fluid. Or maybe your, your version says dropsy. And so, so it's uh, dropsy would have been something that, uh, where your kidneys would be messed up. And so your body is just retaining fluid and you're, you're very swollen. And so again, imagine this. It's like you're at one of the top Pharisees' house. They're watching you. And then just boom. Oh, oh, there's a guy here with dropsy. I don't know how he got here. Oh, just voila, here he is. Where, where did he come from? Because think, this guy, the guy with dropsy, was not really wanted to be there by the Pharisees. They don't want him there. But they invited him there for something else. Because in, in this culture, if you have dropsy, you, you would be considered kind of socially unclean. You know, there, there's something wrong with you. You have some sort of illness or disease. And so people would have been kind of pushing this guy, not just the Pharisees, but everyone would have been like, eh, eh, I don't know if you're really going to hang out with you. There's something definitely wrong with you. I don't want to get it. And so he's the social outcast. And in a lot of people's minds, definitely the Pharisees' mind, they'd be like, oh, you know why you have this? It's because you're an immoral person. You're very sinful. And God's now punking you. And so that would be their mentality. So the Pharisees haven't invited this guy with dropsy because he's their buddy. They're inviting this guy there to use him, to trap Jesus. They're watching him closely and just, oh, and behold, here's, here's this guy. And so it's the Sabbath. Verse 1 says it's the Sabbath. So the Pharisees have planned this whole thing, and they're saying that their mentality is, well, it's the Sabbath. We have this guy here, boom, and he's, we've kind of orchestrated him to be here, and he's sick. And so if Jesus heals him, we got him. Boom. You're doing what we consider unlawful on the Sabbath. You're doing work. It's not necessarily against God's word, but it's against their traditions and customs. So, oh, if you heal him, boom, we got you. But if you don't heal him, Jesus will look uncompassionate and um, uncaring. So either way, they think they, they've got Jesus. And so then in verse 3, in response, because Jesus knows what's up, he knows what they're doing. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And so this, this is awesome. I mean, this is something you, you can't really trap Jesus because he's, the, he's God, the son. But, but Jesus asked them the question, well, is it lawful? Puts it back on them because here, here's what's happening. Now, if Jesus puts the question back on them and if they say, yes, it's lawful, all of them might not actually agree that it's lawful. And so they're, they're going to have some dissension uh, amongst themselves. They also know how, how the rest of the people have, and what their teachings have done. So they can't say it's lawful because they'll look bad. But then they can't say no because then they look like they lack compassion and that they don't care about, about the guy. And so... So he asked them, is it lawful to uh, heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent, right? They're, they're protecting themselves. Well, we can't say yes, we can't say no, so we'll just say nothing. And then Jesus, he took the man and sent him away. Verse 5, and he said to them, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They could find no answer to these things. And so Jesus, 
He's, he's pointing out in verses 5 and 6, he's pointing out their hypocrisy. If you, if you had a son who fell into a pit, you'd go get him, wouldn't you? Of course you would. He's, he's your kid. You need him to work the land with you. You care about him. Heck, even if you had an ox, just an animal that belonged to you, you would do something. You would try to, to help the ox, even if it's on the Sabbath. You would act. Because, because you see how that, that son or that ox benefits you. You care about that thing. And so Jesus is pointing out, the reason that you don't want to do anything for this guy with dropsy is because you lack compassion. You don't care about him. I mean, you're actually using him. A guy that's, that, that, that's hurting, a guy that's, that's suffering, that feels alone. He, he probably knew that you weren't really that interested in inviting him into this, this meal, this party, but, but man, he probably, he probably just chanced it. But if, but if he was your son, if, heck, if he was even one of your animals, your property, you would do something. You would have some sort of compassion on him. But because this guy or other people don't benefit you, you don't want to do anything. And he, so he's pointing out their, their, their pride, their selfishness, their lack of compassion. And so that's just the first point. The first thing that we see in these verses is just a selfish heart. Jesus is pointing that out. You have a selfish heart heart. He keeps, he keeps actually going. Verse 7, Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how uh, they would choose the best seat for themselves. And so before we kind of get into that, like he, in, at this time, you people would, they would sit basically kind of like in a U. So you'd have it here and then like that. And so the, the host and the people of the highest honor would sit at the base of the U. And so if you're the host, you would sit here, and then basically to the people that are, that are closest to you, the, the most honored guests would sit to your left and to your right. And then as people go out, and then that way, the farther away you are from the host, basically the less legit you are, the less important you are. And, and so Jesus, he's, he's noticing what, what they're doing. Everybody's trying to position themselves Maybe they're putting a little name card. Oh, no, it's not. It's not here. It's here. And they're trying to find the best spots at the seat so they could get closer to the host. So they, they, they look more legit. They don't, they want to be more honored. And so Jesus is noticing this. I mean, and th think about it. We, we probably don't really have an equivalent as much to today. Maybe one of the closest things would be when you're in middle school and high school, and it would be where you're sitting at in the cafeteria. There's the cool table. And then there's you, right? And then, then there's me. <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes. You're like, who am I sitting with? Or, or you think if you're on a bus ride, if you did sports or something like that, there was always the cool seats on the bus. And I'll tell you where they weren't. They weren't by coach. You want to get back there, something. And so, so this, Jesus is noticing, hey, this is kind of what you're doing. Verse 8, um, so Jesus says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the place of honor because a more distinguished person than you might be, have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give your place to this man because he's higher up than you. He has more honor. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. So it's like, hey, this guy's invited you and this other guy and you got there first. So you sat in the good seat and now someone more distinguished has come the host is like, well, I can't, this, this more distinguished person, I have to make sure that they sit in the better seat, and then they'll ask you to move, and then the only seat that's left is way in the back. And so Jesus is to, um, just unpacking that for him. But, um, uh, let's see, verse, verse 10, but when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that the one who, inv who, the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And so Jesus is saying, take, take the lower spot. Take, take um, the lower spot. And so what Jesus is saying here is actually probably something that they already knew. I mean, think about it. Everybody there, they, they've been to other parties. They've been to other weddings. 
I mean, you, you know when you go to a wedding, there's a bunch of the tables, and then there's the wedding party table. If you're not in the wedding party, you don't go sit there, because that would be, that'd be weird. That'd be, I mean, if you just went over there, like, well, hey, this table, this table looks like it's first in line for the food. Cool. Let's just sit here. All right. Everybody, hey. And then if the wedding party comes, and then they're like, hey, hi, this is not your seat. Um, well, you need to move. This is for the wedding party. Oh, oh, I mean, that'd be embarrassing. Right? You know it. And so what Jesus is telling them here, they, they've probably seen this play out. They, 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 know the, they know the relational, social, status, look good game. And so what is Jesus exactly getting at? Is Jesus just giving them social advice? I mean, think about it. Is Jesus really spending a lot of his time, hey, I just don't want you to be embarrassed at the next party you go to. There you go. Thumbs up. Now you won't be humiliated. Good job, disciples. Right? Now, that's, this is not about seats. This is not about chairs. Jesus is pointing them to actually using this to point them to something deeper. This is the way that you operate. You're operating on this, this, this status game to make yourself look better. You don't, you, you're, you're very selfish. You lack humility. He's not getting out after chairs. He's getting after their hearts, after something internal. And he's, he's exposing that because look at verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he's saying, that's what you're doing. All of you are about exalting yourself, lifting yourself up, making much of you. You've come to this party, and your idea is that this is for me. This is for, to promote myself, to, to do all these things for me. And so those who humble them, or those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble them himself will be exalted. He also said to one who in, to invite him. So now he's kind of moving from the, ho, the, the guests, everybody. Now he's looking at the host. When you give a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. Now in Ecclesiastes, it, it says that we, can, we should invite our friends and everything. So is Jesus just saying, now just don't do that? He, he's using this kind of almost like hyperbole language to just say, you, that, that's how you almost entirely operate. You need to move it back. Kind of this exaggeration to help make his point of what he's encouraging them to do. Don't invite those people that are going to pay you back. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind. Now what Jesus is kind of telling them here now, when he gets to this, this little story about who to invite to your parties, this now is starting to feel, whoa, whoa, whoa. This would have been kind of economic suicide. I mean, at this time, all the people make their deals and they move up the ladder through the social scene, through parties and banquets and all of those things. It's not just what you know, it's who you know. And so they would, they would invite somebody to, to their house, to their party, to their wedding banquet. That's a little bit higher status than them. Hoping and thinking, well, I invited you and you know what's going to happen? Next time you're going to invite me to that thing, you're going to, you're going to need to repay me because this is a very honor-shame culture, and you would look bad if you didn't invite me back. And so if I could continue to get to know this person, the rich, this person, the more influential, I can move up in my social scene. I can move up in my economic thing. This is how deals were made. And so what Jesus is suggesting that to them is doesn't really jive with their their way of life. They needed to invite people that would benefit them. And Jesus is saying, don't live that way. Don't invite people into your home, into what you're doing for your benefit. And that's Jesus' point right here. He's saying, that's how you operate. You operate in this, you're trying to exalt yourself, trying to think about yourself the way you have selfish hearts that lack compassion. Again, how did this whole thing start? Why did they, the Pharisees, invite the guy with dropsy? 
not to love him, not because they cared about him, but they invited him there to use him. And Jesus is saying, you invited the poor, the, this poor guy here not to love him, but to use him. And actually, that's how you invite everybody else. It's not to love them, it's to use them so that they will repay you, so that you get what you want. Selfish hearts that lack humility, that lack compassion. Now, I think it's easy for us to think, yeah, Jesus, punk them. We're so, so glad we're not like that. And it might not be exactly like that. It might not play out that way, but do we still have that same kind of heart? That, that, we, that we kind of use people or that we push people away or invite them closer based on what they do for us. Here'd be just a quick test. If somebody agrees with you on some sort of stance on a hot topic, do you, and they disagree with you, do you invite them closer or push them away? Hmm? Somebody disagrees with you on, on social media. Are you like, hey, why don't you come over tomorrow? No. Right? Because they don't agree with you. And that doesn't make you feel good about yourself. And because you don't make me feel good about myself, eh. Lower, lower on the friend pecking order, if you're on the friend order at all. Great post, Ricky. Huh. Let's hang out. How are you doing? This is cool. Yeah, it was. Thanks. Huh. Moms, how many of you like it when somebody agrees with you on certain ways that you should discipline your kid or the type of school that you should send them to? Come closer. Oh, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I ain't inviting you. Right? We all do this. Th think of the other things that we use to help build our ourselves up and to feel higher status. Maybe the way we dress, the way we look. If I look a certain way, then pop, pop, pop. Then I'm... I feel more affirmed and validated by the people around me. I drive a certain kind of car. I have a certain kind of home. I do a certain kind of thing. I make a certain kind of money. And if we, if we have those things, then we get the affirmation from other people. We get the, the better feelings from other people. Right? We, we, we all like to feel good about ourselves. And we all like other people to feel good about us, too. And we all have these insecurities. What are they really thinking? What they, what's really going on? And we will do things or not certain things. We do, we might not, you might not even really know you're doing these things. But because in a way, it's not because you're just so eager to show people compassion and love, but it's because what they can do for you. Don't invite people to the party so you get... Repaid. I mean, th think about some, when was the last time you invited someone to meet with you and there was really nothing absolutely in it for you? There's no way that you'd benefit. There's no way that they're going to repay you. There's no way that they're really even going to make you feel good about yourself. And, and that, that's this, this bottom line that Jesus is getting to. Man, this is pride. You have these prideful, selfish hearts that are after you, what benefits you. And when we try to honor and exalt ourselves. So Jesus is exposing that to, to uh, the people there, to the host, to the Pharisees. And then, and then he goes on next. And so, the, um, so he's exposing that selfish heart. Next, he's pointing to God's heart. Look at verse 15. So when, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said, blessed is the one who will eat in the kingdom, um, eat, eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me, I don't know, this just seems like there's just this rando guy that's just shouting like, yeah, you're insulting all of us, Jesus. Woo! 
So, so I don't know if he really agrees with Jesus or if he's just trying to look spiritual or, or maybe he wasn't really paying attention and he just kind of says something. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but he, he just kind of pipes up. Woo! And then Jesus gets going. And he says, okay, then he told him, a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come. Because everything is now ready. And so, so if somebody's going to throw a big banquet, they don't, they don't have text, they don't have social media, any of that. So they would basically, and, and, and gathering all of this food would take them a long time. And so they would send, they, they would kind of almost send out like out a save the date. But it will be like kind of save, save the kind of week or two. This is about when the, the back half of October is when I'm going to have this, this wedding banquet. You coming? And so, so people would have responded already to that that kind of preliminary invite. And they would have said yes or no. And so now, now this, this man, he's like, hey, now everything's ready. Servant, all of those people, we invited a whole bunch of people and they said yes already, so go get them because it's time, it's time to party. And so, um, let's see, verse, uh, verse 18. But without exception, all the, now these are all the people that, that were invited, but without a, a, exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm, trying, um, I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married, and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, because this, you know, all these people said they would come. They knew what was coming up. Then in anger, the master of the house told the servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, blind and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. So I think even the servant anticipated what the master would do. He knew his master pretty well and already did that. And so then, then the master told him, go out into the highways and hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will enjoy my banquet. So he sends the servant out. Hey, it's time to party. Let's go. Bring them all in. And, and they all begin to give excuses of why they can't come. So the first guy says, I bought a field. I got to go look at it. Please excuse me. Now, now this is crazy. You, you wouldn't just buy a field without looking at it, right? I mean, if, if you were, if you're going to buy some big property and somebody just said, Hey, I got some property over here. You want it? Sure. Here's a check, right? You, that, that would be like, no, I need to go look at it first. And so even when he says, he says, I'm going to go look at it. He's probably already seen it. He's already seen it. He's just kind of like, well, I'm just going to go look at it. And think about it. You've already bought the field. It's dirt. It's not going anywhere. You could just go look at it later. Next one, it's, it's kind of the same thing. I bought five yoke of oxen. That is a big investment. Five yoke of oxen. This is huge. This would have, t- I mean, most people, that would have taken them multiple years to just save to buy a couple yoke of oxen. I bought five yoke of oxen. I need to go test them. Again, same thing. You would, he would have already tested them out. He, it's basically like, well, I have a new toy. I want to go just kind of fiddle with it. But I can't come. The last one might seem, well, I just got married. You might be like, well, okay. That kind of makes sense. You know? but, but again, this guy would have already known the party kind of window that this would have happened. And so, and he's already said yes. So in the meantime, he's basically made other plans for himself to do whatever he wanted. So the bottom line is all of these excuses that these three people give are lame. They're all lame. Don't really hold any water. And, and this, this group kind of represents the Pharisees. Too, they're too busy for Jesus. Too busy to invite them into what God's doing. Too self-righteous. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really need to come. You know, it seems kind of optional. I got other stuff going. I got my own agenda. I don't know if I really need to do this. And then, so the master's angry. Because, I mean, think about it. If you're the master of this, of, of the wedding banquet, all of this, you have put in hours and hours money to make this banquet happen to honor the, the wedding party, but also to honor the guests. 
All of this has come at a great expense to himself. And so he says, well, everything's ready. And, and the thought of canceling is like, no way. Go get the poor, the blind, the lame, the crippled. Even, even go outside the city. And I mean, think, think the people that are responding to this. I mean, if you're poor, I mean, think if you were in college and somebody said, hey, you want to come to this? I don't know. There'll be free food. Yep. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, I mean, you might find out like, whoa, this is crazy. I shouldn't have come. This is weird. Well, there's still free food. <laughs> and so, so when, the, when this guy goes out there, and he's like, everybody come in. Of course they're going to come in because they see their need. I have nothing. I'm homeless. I'm poor. I'm blind. I'm lame. I'm crippled. Yeah, I'm invited to a wedding feast. I might not get another invite like this ever again in my life. But I get to, I get to go feast. I'm scrapping by. They see their need. Of course I'm going. This is amazing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that, that see how, just how poor they are spiritually, how bankrupt they are spiritually. And so those who will accept the invitation are those who will see their spiritual need and those who will be like, nah, I don't need it. I don't really need you, Jesus. Are those who recognize really just how much they need Christ. And I just encourage you, who are you in, the, in that story? Are you the ones that recognize I mean, because the, the, the guy in the story represents God and Jesus. Jesus' invitation to you, come, come, eat with me, celebrate with me, be with me, come into relationship with me. And here's the thing, it always is at his expense, not yours. The guy who throws the party, he's the one that pays for everything. Jesus is the one that paid for all of your sin, not you. Jesus was the one that was perfectly righteous, not you. I've done everything for you. I've, I've, I've made a way for you to be saved. For you, not because you're a good person, not because you show up to church enough, none of that. It is by the life of Christ and the death of Christ, by the grace of God, that you, that you can come. So please come. And so have you accepted that invitation to be with Jesus, to trust in him, not in yourself, but in his life, death, and resurrection. Now you could have this relationship with God that isn't built on you. On just how well you think you're doing. But it's, we can't earn it. We can't deserve it. It's, it's off of his grace. Have you accepted an invitation? And so in the story, we notice the, God's heart in this. God wants to fill his house. I mean, even right at the beginning, he invited many. Notice all the words. He invited many. Come, compel them to come, bring them in. That's the heart of God. God's the one saying, none of these people are going to pay me back. I'm not doing this because there's something in it for me. Just come. I want you to be with me. Come. I want you to celebrate with me. He has compassion for people. The, 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 the meal is not complete unless everyone can be there. No family member is left out. Even that, that word house there, have them come into my house, that, that conveys this, this familial relationship. And he's talking about that. Go to the people outside the city. Go to the poor, the blind, the lame, so that they might come into my house it, like a family member. That's the heart of God towards you, towards, towards all of us. I mean, our relationship with Jesus is... is I mean, if you think, what's in it for you, Jesus? It's not like Jesus or God needs your affirmation. God doesn't need your praise. But there, there's nothing in it for God. We don't repay God. And Jesus' heart, he pursues you, pursues people, because his heart is filled with love and compassion. I mean, think of even what comes right after this. Chapter 15. The, the man looking for his lost sheep. 
The woman looking for her lost coin, the dad looking for his lost son, that's the heart of God. I'll look everywhere for you. I'm going to search the house to find you everywhere. Man, I'm looking for you. Gosh, son, will you come back? Will you come home? Oh, gosh, there he is. I'm going to sprint. I'm going to run towards you, run towards the lost, run towards the hurting, towards those who are far away, who feel alone and left out, who are the poor, poor in spirit. That's God's heart in this. Come to the table. For those of you that, are, that feel outcast, I know a student here, here at the church, they were going to a new school. First day of school, they don't really know anybody. They go into the cafeteria, and they're alone. They see everybody else that has friends, and they sit down at a table by themselves. They eat by themselves. And seeing everybody else have their friends and have their little circles being ignored, just nobody wants to eat with me. Nobody notices me. I'm alone. I'm an outcast. She went home, told her brother about this. And her brother goes to a different school. And the next day, the brother was like, there's no way that I want anyone to feel that way. I don't want anyone to feel alone. I don't want anybody to feel outcast. And so just stood up in the, in the middle of the, the lunchroom and just said, hey, if you don't have anyone to sit with, you come sit with me. Man, the heart of God for people, for you. I don't want, he doesn't want that for anybody. So he invites us to this table. Come, compel them to come. And so then this turns us to seeing God's heart helps lead us to, to the third thing, a changed heart. Seeing God's heart leads us, leads us to have a changed heart. And look at verse, we're going to go back to verse 11. This is the main thing that Jesus is commanding us, moving us towards. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you would be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I mean, what Jesus commands us to do here is hard. Don't. Worry about exalting yourself. Humble yourself. Here's the problem with that. Jesus, do you know how the world works? What you're telling me to do isn't how the world works. Do you know how you get promoted? You promote yourself. Do you know how you get noticed? You make yourself noticed. Do you know how get people to, to like you? Is you act in a way so that they like you. I mean, are you serious, Jesus? I'm not supposed to, to exalt myself, to lift up myself, to be about myself? To help myself, I'm supposed to be humble? That's not how the world works. I know that we all like that when, when in 1 Samuel, I think it's uh, 11, when, when Samuel goes out to, to um, anoint David, we like that verse where it says, God looks at the heart. And that's true, but what does the first part say? But people look at the outward appearance. That is also true. And we know it. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be affirmed. And so, Jesus, how am I supposed to live in a way that I'm not so insecure around people and after their affirmation, after what they can give me? How do I live like that and be, and be humble, humble myself? Because I will exalt you. You don't have to worry about lifting yourself up or getting affirmation from other people because I've already given that to you freely. If we want to live this way that, that God is calling us into, we have more and more we need to be captivated by God. That, that God sent his son to have you. The more that, that you are captivated by that, you'll begin more and more to be free of living for the recognition of others. Why? Because you have the complete recognition of God. God has created everything. 
And it's a recognition that you didn't earn. It's a recognition and a love and an acceptance that you can't mess up this week. Because Christ has bought it for you. Christ has earned it for you. Others praising you. And you know what God has done for me? I I don't have to perform to get his love. I don't have to worry about, man, am I accomplishing everything? I don't need you to lift me up. God is lifting me up out of my sin and my shame and my brokenness permanently and every day. His voice is the only voice that I need to hear. His approval. The status that he, I don't need the status that you give me. I already have the status as a child of God. That's how we have these these changed heart and changed lives. Then we can operate in a way that's not about what's in it for us. Because of what Christ has done for us. And I just want to ask you, does what Christ has done for you, what he actually even is doing right now, does what, does Christ, who he is, what he's done for you, what he's doing, does that change you? Does that actually change the way you live? Your heart, your attitude, your perspective. He invites us. He has this humongous heart, love, affection for us, and he invites us, come share with me in my heart. Come share with me in what I'm doing because, he, because the command that he gives them is the same thing that he does in the parable. Right? The master's the one. Invite everybody. Invite the poor, the blame, the lime. Hey, I want you also to do that, to live a life that isn't about people repaying you. God's table, there's always room at God's table. I just want to encourage us, do do we have kind of, you know, God's table, this invitation to himself, this relationship with him, do we have kind of a really small view of God's table? I mean, think about it. If, let's say that your your favorite singer, Taylor Swift, whoever it might be, that's not mine, probably ACDC or something, but, um, you know, so that godly band, Um, (laughs) or somebody like that, or, or, you know, this would be cool for me. Let's say Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man. Elizabeth Olsen, Scarlet Witch, Benedict Cumberbatch, who, who's Dr. Strange. Let's say that they invite you to this party. And they're like, hey, hey, Ricky. Hey, man, we would just love, we're having this huge party out here. We'd love to invite you. Now, you'd be thinking, is this real? Because you don't, you don't really know me. I'm a nobody. You're these super, you know, all-stars and, and celebrities. Why invite me? And they're like, no, this is totally legit. They even FaceTime you. It even gets a little bit of news time. Gosh, Oh, celebrities invite person from Podunk, Nebraska. It's not for everybody, but this party is, right? Like, you'd be like, this is crazy. And they say, hey, actually, I mean, this, this party's going to be amazing. It's going to be so crazy, and we'll pay for everything. We'll fly you out. We'll get you a car, all of these things. And, I mean, you, are you going? You don't have to work, right? You're like, I'm, you're already punching in the time. You're like, this, this is crazy, and if they, what if they said, hey, also, you can invite 100 people, all expenses paid. You're like, heck yeah, sure. I mean, you, who are you? Who are you? I don't know. You don't go to this party? You're like, you would just ask them. Right? And here's, here's why you would go and why you'd be so excited to go and, and invite everybody else with you. Because whose party is it is? Who's inviting you? How much greater should we be excited about the invitation of God, creator of the universe, the one who knows everything about you and still invites you to come. The people around you to come. Go invite everybody. Compel them to come in. We should be so eager. Where where do we start in this? I'd encourage you, start by praying. Start by praying. Asking God to change your heart. Asking God for the people around you in your life that are hurting, are lost, don't know Christ, don't even know that they're invited into this relationship with God and into salvation because of God's grace. Start praying for them specifically by name. Do this with with your friends. Pray with with your friends, with the people in your city. Pray with your spouse. Pray with your kids. You want a great way to disciple your kids? Show them that you don't have a puny God that's just about thanking them for food and when you have a boo-boo. God, 
But who should we invite into our home this week? Praying for that. Invite someone over. And I know what a bunch of you are thinking. Well, that's hard. I'm going to invite somebody that, that maybe I'm not close with or my coworker or my neighbor that really maybe doesn't know Jesus. I'm going to invite them into my home, into my life. And I would say, yeah, that is. I, I think that there's a reason right after this, Jesus talks about the cost of following him. Hey, the invitation to the party is totally free. But to follow me, to be my disciple, yeah, it does cost. It is hard. I get it that time might be scarce for you. And so maybe, maybe it's really often, maybe it's not really often, but, but here's kind of the question I have for you is, is when we hear this, reach out, evangelism, mission for God, why is kind of our, our, our default posture and our first impulse? No. Or maybe. Right? We kind of treat it as optional. If I get around to it, think of the heart of the master. Come, everyone come. That was his, his heart posture. And the more and more that, that he had a heart for the people, and, and the more and more that we meet with people, invite them into our life, meet, have a meal, have coffee, have whatever it is with them, the more and more that who they are in their story becomes personal to you. Because the more and more that you actually just love and care for them. And even, even their lostness, them not knowing Jesus becomes personal to you. You so want them to know Christ. Because why? Because they've moved from just someone out there to a person that you know. And you care about them. God's invited us, yes, to the table, but to join him in what he's doing in this world. Our salvation is not just for us. The love of Christ compels us. And he died so that and he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. What if, what if you, what if we gave up the cruise ship mentality? What if we gave up the mentality that our comfort is more important than our Christ? More important than people? And we started to shift our expectations. We started to shift our perspective and just our loves and our hearts towards Christ and towards the people around us in our neighborhoods, at our workplace, our friends that maybe don't know Jesus. Imagine what God will do. Imagine that people out there will feel seen Imagine that people will, that maybe didn't know the love of Christ, they begin to see it through you. Imagine people seeing people love their kids, love their spouses, go through grief and still looking to Jesus, still imperfectly, but they're walk, watching you still imperfectly go through life, but still loving Christ. Imagine someone accepting God's invitation to his table because they first were invited to yours. God's voice is the only one that we need and we can live differently because he's invited us into his table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you um, that this really is your heart. And Lord, I pray that you would help us. God, this is, this is hard. Help us to, to be okay to even just take a step towards sacrificing our schedule, sacrificing our comfort for you, for what you're wanting to do in us, around us, in this world. Help us to see more and more of our, our life, our schedule isn't, our homes are not here for us. They're not here to, to serve us. Lord, but it's for your glory that your name might be lifted up. So Lord, I pray that you would, would move in us in a, in a powerful way, Lord, so that, that your house may be full, so that people would know that they have been invited to you, to this relationship um, with you to salvation. So we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.